When I was back in the army, you could be punished and locked up for causing yourself a self-inflicted injury. Yet as I look around the world today, I see so many people who are causing them self-inflicted pain through their immaturity, through their behavior, and through their sin. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond. Welcome to Christianity Works, as again today we open God's Word, the Bible, to see what God has to say into our pain and into our suffering, because this series we're in the middle of is called Pain Relief for the Soul. There is so much self-inflicted injury going on in this world today. There are so many people who are suffering because of their sin, because of their immaturity, because of their selfishness, because of their anger, because of their bad behaviour. Look, none of us is perfect. I'm not perfect and you, you aren't perfect either. So let's be honest in dealing with this stuff. Let's stop sweeping it under the carpet because it's not going away unless we do something about it. I want to go back to a passage that we've looked at before in this series, but it's a powerful passage because it's the passage that talks about the consequences of the first sin that occurred. When creation began, God created Adam and Eve and they lived together perfectly, in perfect harmony, in perfect joy, in perfect peace, in the Garden of Eden. And God said, look, enjoy everything in the garden, all the fruit, all the, everything you want. There's one thing, though, that you can't do. Right in the middle of the garden, right smack bang in the middle, is a tree which I call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat the fruit of that tree. Well, yeah, we know the story. Adam and Eve couldn't help themselves. A serpent came along and tempted the wife and the wife took a bite and she gave it to her husband and he took a bite and all of a sudden they knew the difference between good and evil. They had never known evil before simply because it didn't exist until they disobeyed God. And immediately the conscience that God put in their hearts told them about evil. They realized they were naked so they covered themselves up and they hid in the garden. Let's look at the consequences of that sin in their lives for you and me today. We're starting at Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman blamed the servant. The servant tricked me, she said. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, and all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It seems like this one incy-wincy little sin has such dramatic consequences. That's because there is no such thing as a small sin. Whenever we reject God, we reject God. We reject the God who loves us, who created the universe, who created us. And there are always consequences 
to our sin. Let's stop kidding ourselves. Let's stop pretending that we can write ourselves a little dispensation. Look, my sins are only small. They, they won't really hurt. I know I cheated on my tax return last year, but, but who's going to know? Answer, God knows. And, and when we continue to sin, there will be consequences because God loves us. So he will bring discipline on our lives. And discipline, as we've seen before in the book of Hebrews, is never a whole bunch of fun at the time. I remember when I was a boy, when my father disciplined me, man, I hated my father for that. I was so angry with my father for that. It hurt so much to be disciplined. Remember once I was being so selfish, so difficult as a teenager, my father decided I had a lesson to learn. So he said, you, my son, need to learn to do things for other people. So every night after I come home from work, you are going to polish my shoes. So I had to clean my father's dirty, smelly shoes, put my hands inside the sweaty shoes and clean his shoes every night. Man, I hated my father for that. But you see, that discipline, whilst I didn't like it at the time, has helped make me who I am today. And today, with my grey hair and my years and my wisdom, I look back on what my father did and say, well, you know what, Dad? Thank you for doing that. Thank you for, for taking the time and the effort and putting the emotional energy into me to teach me those lessons. God always disciplines us just as a good father will discipline his children. And, and sin is something that God wants to remove from our lives. Let's have a look at some of the sins that we actually get into. I'm going here to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And it's a really interesting list of sins. For I fear that when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. I fear that there may perhaps be quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and that I may have to mourn over many who previously sinned and have not repented of their impurity, sexual immorality, and licentiousness that they have practiced. Hey, that's quite a list. And I'm sure in that list, you can find one or two things that you deal with too. Let's read it again. Quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, conceit, disorder, sexual immorality, impurity, licentiousness. Come on. We, we carry on with some stuff. And you know, anger and quarreling in, in God's eyes is just as bad as sexual immorality. God doesn't have a hierarchy of sins. Sin is sin, including taking an apple off a tree when God said, don't eat from that tree. We want to write ourselves this dispensation. We want to say, well, you know, I'm okay. I'm not a bad person. Come on, wake up. Sin always ruins our lives. We want to be selfish. We, we want to do it our way. We, we want to reject God and say, well, look, I'm entitled. I can run my own life. And when we do that, friend, we're going to suffer. There is going to be pain. There are going to be consequences. Just like there were when I was a child and I disobeyed my father. There are going to be painful consequences. Is that really the way you want to live? Or do you want to be more like Jesus? Let's read this bit. We're going to Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. In other words, he didn't say, I'm entitled, but rather, verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, there's two ways that we can get suffering. Either by disobeying God, and he will bring suffering in our lives to teach us the lesson so that we can learn, so that we can grow, so that we can be disciplined, so that we can be pruned. And the quicker we learn the lesson, the, the less we're going to suffer. That's the avoidable suffering. Avoid the avoidable. Listen to God today. Honor God in your life. And avoidable suffering will disappear from your life. But following Jesus is going to involve suffering too. And we're going to see in, in the remainder of this series how to deal with that unavoidable suffering. Jesus promised it to us. John chapter 16, verse 33. 
in this world you will have tribulation. You will. You will have suffering. You will be persecuted. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I just want to share with you, over the next few moments, some powerful verses about the getting of God's wisdom. The first one comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 35. The wise will inherit honour, but the stubborn fools disgrace. We can continue to resist God. We can continue to be stubborn and we will inherit disgrace. You've seen it. People behave badly and, and other people don't want to be with them. Other people don't want to respect them. Well, God brings disgrace upon those people who behave badly. The wise, the ones who listen to God, the ones who bow their will down before God, the ones who want to honour God, they will inherit the honour of God. But the stubborn fools will inherit disgrace. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1. One who is often reproved yet remains stubborn will suddenly be broken beyond healing. God doesn't want to punish us. God doesn't want to discipline us. But when he does discipline us, when he does bring it to that point of saying, well, Bernie, you know, I've got to deal with this issue in your life because if I don't deal with it, you're going to continue hurting yourself and hurting other people. We can either cooperate with God or we can resist God. One who is often reproved yet remains stubborn will suddenly be broken beyond healing. See, God only reproves us as much as he needs to. He's not a mean guy. He's not a mean God. He's a God who loves us like a good father loves his children. If God reproves me once and I learn the lesson quickly, he doesn't reprove me again for that same thing. But if he has to keep reproving and keep reproving and keep reproving, at some point, I've got to tell you, you're going to break. God's going to win. God is more powerful than us. The easy way or the hard way? The, the, the humble way or the stubborn way? Come on. Which one is it going to be? Here's the bottom line. God loves you as a good father loves his children. He will discipline you and reprove you to deal with a stubborn sin in your life. Cooperate with God quickly. And, you know, the only way we can do that is when we're in God's word on a daily basis. When, when we read something like that, you go, man, that's why things are so hard. God's actually dealing with something in my life. God wants to speak to you and me through his word. And when we are men and women of his word, when we're listening to him, then we can cooperate with God quickly. We can learn the lesson quickly. And I've got to tell you, it's a much better life because what God wants to bring to our life is, is the fruit of peace and joy and righteousness. That's what God's aiming for in your life. I just want to remind you of that free booklet I've been telling you about. It's called Taking the Pain Out of Life. It's full of teaching to help you deal effectively with pain, to avoid the avoidable and to deal with the unavoidable pain in your life. There are also questions at the end of each chapter to help you apply the teaching, to apply God's word to the realities of your life. This is so important. That's why I'd love to send you this booklet, Taking the Pain Out of Life, as my free gift to you. Get in touch with us right now. The contact details are on your screen and we'll get it out to you just as quickly as we can. I'm Bernie Diamond and you're watching Christianity Works. One of the reasons that you and I suffer pain in life is that we don't listen to the good advice that's given to us. One of the things I've learned over the last umpteen years of being, ma being married to my beautiful wife is that she often has wisdom that I don't. You know, often we men, we don't want to listen to our wives. We think we know better. We're stubborn. We carry on. But so often our wives have, have powerful insight and wisdom that we ourselves don't have. Why is it that sometimes we don't want to listen to good advice? I remember when I was growing up as a teenager, my parents had good advice for me and I resisted and I carried on and, and I refused to listen. And yet over the years as I've grown older and I've got more grey hair on my head, I've remembered some of the things my parents taught me and I've realised how, how right they were. We don't like to listen to criticism. We don't like reproof. We don't like correction. We often don't want to listen to good sound advice. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 22 says this, without counsel plans go wrong but with many advisors they succeed. I was recently in India 
And we're working on a technology project with a group from the US, um, with some developers in India and myself from Australia. Now, it's fair to say that when we came into this meeting together, not everyone was really on the same page. Um, some of the people felt a little bit stressed by what was being proposed. And we sat down and we talked the issues through. We dealt with the hard issues. The issues that I knew were the stumbling blocks in moving this project forward. The amazing thing was that everybody sitting around that table, the Americans, there were two from America, um, the Indians, there were several from India, and the Australians, were all mature Christians. They were all people who seemed to want to open their hearts and their ears to sound advice. And at the end of that meeting, there was such a strong consensus around the table because nobody held on to their position. Everybody listened. They listened to sound advice. We all learned from each other. And now the project is moving forward. Isn't that a great way of living? Isn't that a great way of doing things? Why do we want to be stubborn? Why do we want to refuse to listen to good counsel and sound advice? You know, God has some pretty good wisdom and some pretty sound advice for you and me too. And the, the single thing, the single activity that has changed me most in the last 20 years since I gave my life to Christ is listening to God's word for myself by reading the Bible. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, the fear of God doesn't mean sitting there and trembling in your boots. When I was a child and I lived with my parents, I had a right fear, a right respect of my father. I knew that if I disobeyed my father, there would be some serious consequences. Now, dad didn't lash out at me. Dad wasn't horrible to me. Dad loved me. He cared for me. He brought me up. But if I stepped over the line, there were consequences. Problem is, many people today don't know where the line is. They, they draw the line for themselves and they say, oh, look, that behavior's fine. This behavior's fine. It's okay if I'm selfish. It's okay if I'm rude. You don't find out where the line is unless you're a man or a woman of God's word. You don't find out what God's wisdom is. You don't find out what God's response is. You don't find, how, find out how God thinks and behaves and reacts. Unless you read the word of God, the living word of the living God, sharper than any two-edged sword, unless you read it for yourself. I see so many people in this world, a friend of mine whom I know, he's going through some tough things in his life. He struggles with anger. I try and bring him to God's word. And he says, no, nah, I find God's word boring. I don't want to read it. A friend, you're going to continue to suffer. If you don't want to listen to the counsel of God, if you don't want to say, God, I'm going to stop being stubborn. I'm going to stop resisting you. I'm going to stop behaving badly. I'm going to read what you say. I'm going to believe it and I'm going to accept it and I'm going to live it in your power. Until we get to that point, friend, we're going to keep hurting ourselves. We're going to keep hurting other people. The wisdom that my parents shared with me when I was young, I didn't accept when I was young. There's a saying that we have that you can't put an old head on you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Yeah? But as I've grown up and accepted their wisdom and learned from them, it's made a huge difference in my life. As it has when I've listened to the counsel of God, when I've feared God, when I've respected and honoured God, by listening to what he says and saying, you know what, God, I may not want to really deal with my anger issues, but I know I'm going to have to. I don't really have the power to deal with my anger, but I know your word does. And I know your word has the supernatural spiritual power to be lifted off the page and put into my heart by the Holy Spirit. When are we, when are we gonna wrap our minds and our hearts around that and honestly start believing what the Bible says? Start doing what the Bible says. Start being who the Bible says we are. It's not the, the listeners of the word, but it's the doers of the word of God that see the powerful transformation that God can bring in their life. Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus came to transform your life. We either take this seriously or we don't. Will you accept the word of God into your heart today? Come with me please to James chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. It says this, Or do you suppose 
that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in you. But he gives all the more grace, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, as long as we disregard the wisdom of God, as long as we disregard the word of God, as long as we say, I know better, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life, that's pride. And the Bible says that 100% of the time, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Do you want God, the God who created the whole universe, the, the, the almighty God with so much power that we can't comprehend, do you want that God to oppose you 100% of the time? See, my father never reinforced my bad behavior. My father opposed my bad behavior. My father used his authority and his strength and his wisdom to stand against my bad behavior when I disobeyed him. God does exactly the same because he's a good dad. He's a dad who loves you. He's a dad who cares for you. It's this stiff-necked stubbornness that God is speaking into through his word today. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Jesus told a story about two men who went to the temple. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. The Pharisee, the religious leader, was all self-righteous. He said, oh God, thank you that I'm really good. Thank you that I'm not a, a sinner like that tax collector over there. But the tax collector, the tax collector wouldn't even come near. He said, God, I, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. God, I, please forgive me. And Jesus said, which of those two men do you think went home justified in the eyes of God, forgiven in the eyes of God. It wasn't the Pharisee, it was the tax collector. It was the one who humbled himself, who had a right fear of God, who was honest with God and said, God, I'm not worthy. I've stuffed this up. I'm, I've made a mess of my life. Please, please forgive me. You see, when we, when we confess the reality of our spiritual poverty, the reality of our sin to God, God says, there's a man. There's a woman who is humbling themselves before me. Listen again to what it says in James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives his unmerited favor, his undeserved favor to those who humble themselves. See, this is the root of our problem in society. This is why we cause ourselves so much pain, because we stubbornly resist God. Are you holding out on God? Is there some part of your life in your heart that you've locked God out of one particular little room? We do that. We say, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do... And yet there's one area of our life that we resist God, where we hold out on God. That is stubbornness. That is pride. And that is going to cost us something because God opposes the proud. But open that up. Confess it to God. Ask him to clean it out. And he will give grace to the humble. This is what the Bible says. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 8. Do not now be stiff-necked as your ancestors were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and come into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger may turn away from you. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were, but yield yourself. Friend, yield that one thing that you are holding back from God. Give it to him and say, God, I lay it down. My selfishness, my pride, my, my anger, my, my sexual immorality, my desire for wealth, whatever it is, give that thing to him today. And my friend, he will set you free from a world of, of pain. Father, we can be a stubborn and stiff-necked people. We do hold things back from you. Father, right now, I pray that your spirit would convict us of that one thing that each one of us is withholding from you. And by the power of your spirit, open our hearts, soften our hearts. Lord, we yield that thing to you today. We give it up. We lay it down at the foot of the cross. 
we give it to you, we give it up, and we turn away from it. We repent. Lord, take it up. Take our sin. Set us free through the cross. Set us th free through what Jesus did. Set us free from the, the sin in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you may remove the pain and the suffering and the punishment and the opposition that are the consequences of that sin. Father, we ask that from you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friend, I'm believing that God has set you free from something today. I'm believing that God has set the captives free so that you can live the new life, the resurrection life, the life that Jesus came to give you from now through to all of eternity. May you be blessed as you receive the mighty word of God into your heart. Well, friend, that's all we have time for today. You've been watching Christianity Works, and my name's Bernie Diamond. Please don't forget, I'd love to send you that free booklet I've been telling you about, Taking the Pain Out of Life, with some more teaching from God's Word, and also at the end of each chapter, some life application questions, so that you can take what you've learned and apply it into your life. That's what this booklet is all about, seeing your life touched and transformed, and that's why I so passionately want to give this booklet to you as a free gift. Get in touch with us today using those contact details on your screen and we'll get it straight out to you just as quickly as we can. Well, I'm off. I'll catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace and God's mercy for each one of us in Jesus Christ.